Hey Elevate, we are back with you for our series, Asking for a Friend. My name is Liz. And I'm Kamala. And we're so excited to be answering some questions tonight, okay? Um, we're gonna answer a few, some guys are gonna answer a few, and we're just gonna have a great time together. So hey, we're just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna read one of the questions that we got. Um, this is a great question. Quality friendships, how do we build them and how do you know when you found them? You know, what I love about this question, whoever asked this, is that you use the word built, because that's the truth. Friendships are built, they're not stumbled upon. And you know, friendships are something that we're honestly gonna be dealing with for the rest of our life. There are gonna be some friendships that are for our whole life that we know forever, but some of our sweetest friendships are probably gonna happen in seasons later on. And so we're always having to learn how to develop relationships and develop friendships. And you know, um, some of us might think, man, this is just hard, like it's hard to have a good friend. How do I How do I have these friendships that I see other people have? Is there a secret? Is there a formula? Um, do only really outgoing people get to have these awesome friendships? And the answer is no. And you know, something that I love is that the Word of God has everything that we need for life, right? Everything that we could ever need to know can be found in here. And um, one of the principles that's all throughout the Bible is the spiritual law of sowing and reaping. And it applies to so many areas of our life, but I really feel like it applies to building relationships and specifically friendships. So I'm gonna read one of my favorite scriptures that have to do with sowing and reaping. So this is in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So honestly, that's it. You have to invest, you have to sow seeds into people to be able to reap a friendship. And um, so, so many times it's easy to wait for somebody else to do it, but the truth is like, you just have to go first. You have to invest, you have to be intentional and sow seed and sow seed and sow some more seed. Um, but one day you're gonna look up and you're gonna have a beautiful friendship and you're gonna be able to see the fruit of that and see the harvest of that. And I'll say this too, you might, you might spend some time investing in somebody and sowing seeds and not see anything come out of it and no reciprocation and that's okay. Ask the Lord to show you who to invest in, who, he yeah. ins who it is he wants you to be running with in this season and you can turn your attention there. Um, I want to talk for a second just real practically about investing and being intentional in friendships because I think this is something no matter where we are in life we can all learn. I'm going to share just a few things that I've learned and most of these are from other people um, and I honestly think they're gold. So if you're a middle schooler, if you're a high schooler, if you're an adult, if you're a parent, if you're watching this, I think this is something that all of us can learn from. So I'm just going to go through these real quick. Um, when you're looking to build friendships, here's a few things. One, learn people's love languages, learn their personality type and what they like. This is key for learning how to be intentional with people and how to make them feel loved and how to make them feel known, okay? Number two, ask a lot of questions. Be genuinely interested in people. Don't be concerned about being self-promoting or being understood. Um, really seek to know somebody and you're gonna see that it's gonna mean a lot to them. Number three, remember important things in people's lives. Um, if there's gonna be something happening in someone's life or something that already did happen, be intentional to remember those dates and to let them know that you're thinking about them on those days. And that might be doing a calendar invite, it might be taking notes, but being there for people in important moments of their life really makes an impact and really lets them know that you're invested and that you're in it with them for the long haul. And then lastly, be a conversation starter. Don't wait for someone to text you first. If you're thinking about somebody, go ahead and shoot them a text. Maybe send them a meme that's funny that made you think of them. Maybe send them a quote. Maybe just say, hey, I was thinking about you. How's your day going? Or, hey, friend check-in, what's going on? Um, and I think sometimes we can get so caught up in, well, this person hasn't texted me for a while. I don't know how they feel about me. No, just text them first, go first. And, um, you know, it's a great way to be intentional and just learn how to invest with people. I wanna end just with this quote. This is by Dale Carnegie. Um, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. Okay, so basically, like, be the friend that you want sow seeds of friendship and you're gonna see a harvest in that. That was such a good question, Liz, I love that. The next question that we have is, how do you ignore what others think about you? Man, that's a really, really good question. 
And I know how this feels. We all know how this feels. The pressure of other people's opinions can be such a dangerous place in all of our minds. You know, I remember being in high school and being so concerned with what other people thought about me. I remember even being probably about 14 years old, being at youth group, and I was so afraid to even pray out loud in front of my friends or if somebody asked me for prayer, I would get so nervous. Y'all, I would get so scared, my hands would start sweating. I was so embarrassed because I was so concerned about what my peers would think about me. And you know, from an early age, it kind of almost feels like, um, you know, that we, we feel the pressure of those people's opinions over our lives. And sometimes it almost feels like we have a void inside of our hearts and emotionally if we don't receive affirmation from other people. You know, but for me, what this question really leads my mind to think of is a great scripture found in Proverbs 29, 25, and I'm gonna read it. It says, it is dangerous to be concerned with what other people think of you, but if you trust the Lord, you're safe. I know that this is so much harder than how it even sounds. It's so tough not to care about what other people think about us. And at times, the opinions of other people seem so loud in our ears. It seems like we can't even escape how we feel that other people view us. But whenever that thought comes to mind, this is the thought I want you to replace it with. What does God think about me? I'm gonna say it again. What does God think about me? You know, this makes me think of an awesome movie, of a certain scene in a movie called The Lion King. Basically, we find Simba. He's a young king and he's questioning who he is and his journey, and he's questioning who he is, what he's meant to do, what his destiny is supposed to be. And you know, he has this revelation where basically he sees his father and he hears his father say, remember who you are. I love this scene so much because we find Simba and he hears his father reminding him who he is and encouraging him into who he's meant to be. And you know, we have to remember who God, our father in heaven, reminds us who we are. God says that we're loved, that we're accepted, we're chosen, we're forgiven, and we're courageous. And I wanna remind you, you have nothing to prove to anybody, you have nobody to impress. We need to be focused on our relationship with God and just being faithful to God. And I wanna encourage everybody with this, God sees you. God says that you can do it. And you know what, even if you're discouraged, God can see that challenge, but he can also see your victory. And how can we get this in a practical level? What we can do, grab a journal, set aside some time and focus on God and say, God, what is it that you say about me? Start writing that stuff down. Write down those promises that God says about you, that you're forgiven, that you're chosen, that you're accepted, that you're loved, that you're a child of God. Write those things down. And just to wrap it up, I'm gonna read the scripture. It's Joshua 1, 9. It says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So to wrap up, I just wanna say, be strong. Remember who you are. Remember your identity does not come from other people around you. It doesn't come from the thoughts of others, but it comes from God and it comes from his word. That's awesome, I love that. What a good encouragement for you ladies. Okay, y'all, I'm gonna go ahead and read our next question. Is it okay to date a non-Christian? Hey, that's a very real question, yeah, and I'm proud of whoever shot that out to us. We're gonna definitely talk about that, and I really wanna say what the Word of God has to say about this, but before we get there, let's unpack this a little bit, okay? So if you're a Christian and you're pursuing Jesus, then the Word of God is your foundation, right? It's your framework. It's what, you know, all the decisions that you make in your life are based on, and the way you approach your relationships should be on the Word of God, right? So if you bring somebody else into the equation and they aren't looking at things the same way and they don't have the same foundation as you, you're gonna have some conflict. You're not gonna be on the same page about things, okay? So just practically two things that come to mind are purity and faithfulness. If you go into a relationship with someone and have a goal of what you want your purity to look like and wanting to be faithful to each other, 
and someone else doesn't have that same framework, well, there could potentially potentially be some problems. And that's those are no small things, right? Like, they're things that should be taken seriously, um, things that we really need to guard our heart about. And so, I mean, if you take it a step further and thinking about marrying someone that doesn't have the same belief system as you, man, that can get really messy, okay? I mean, how are you going to steward your finances? That's a biblical issue. What are you going to teach your kids? That's a biblical issue. Who are you going to hang out with? Who are you going to go to church with? Are you going to go to church? Those are all things to be thinking about. And you might be saying, Liz, Liz, I'm not trying to marry this person. I'm just trying to have some fun. Well, I would say still guard your heart. Yeah. Guard your heart. It's so, so important. Um, I want to get back to the question and I want to look in God's word, but I just want to say whoever sent this in, I want you to know that you're not alone. You're not the first person who's asked this question. In fact, people have been asking this question for a long time. In the Old Testament, the Israelites asked God the very same thing. They wanted to ask, they wanted to marry people of other nations who had different faiths. So this is what God's response to them was in Deuteronomy 7 um, verse 3 through 4 if you're in your Bibles. You must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters, or they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. That feels a little heavy, right? <laughs> it's like, ooh, really direct. God's, God's not beating around the bush with that. And you're probably thinking, well, that's really serious. I'm not gonna go worship another idol. I'll be the exception. That won't happen to me. Like, I'm strong in my faith. Well, I want us to really quickly consider Solomon in the Bible, right? He was considered like the wisest man. And even he didn't heed this warning that God gave and um, it ended up significantly changing his story. Let's look really quick in 1 Kings 11, 2 through 4. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. That's just a whole nother thing to talk about. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. And in Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God. So guys, if Solomon, someone who wrote books in the Bible, was you know, revered for his wisdom, if he could have his heart turned to not be faithful to the Lord, how much more do we need to be careful and be discerning, okay? And here's the thing, if there's someone in your life that um, you would date in an instant if they knew the Lord, if there's someone that you're thinking of right now, I want you to think about this. You need to pray for them, okay? Our chief desire for people to come and meet Jesus is so that they know Jesus, not just so they're eligible for us to date, okay? Someone being the Lord is the most important thing. And then I also just wanna encourage you in that Deuteronomy passage, the very next verse is something really powerful. It says, of all the people on earth, the Lord God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. So that's a word for you, like you're a treasure and all these boundaries that God gives us, they're for your benefit, they're to keep you safe, they're to keep your heart turned toward him. Um, so don't settle, don't settle girl or guy, whoever <laughs> you right. are, you are way too valuable for that. So good, so good. All right, next question. That's so good, Liz. I love that. Just having that practical standpoint and also just remembering who you are, that you're yeah. treasured and yeah. that you guys are awesome. We're going to do the last question here. And this question is a little bit more heavy, but it says, what should I do when I'm ignoring the red flags in a person because I want to be with them? Mm -hmm. Man, that's a tough question. You know, sometimes things are bad for us, but they make us feel really happy in a moment, right? Listen, I love chocolate and I love sugar. Like, I really love it a lot. I'm instantly more happy when I take a bite of an Oreo because they're amazing and they make me so happy. But at the same time, I know that these aren't necessarily really great for me. Now listen, one time I went too far over the edge. I ate an entire pack of Oreos in one sitting. Was I happy? Yes, in the moment, it was a ton of fun. I loved my life. But immediately afterwards, guess what? I felt super sick, right? It was something that made me really happy in a moment, but afterwards, I had to suffer the consequence of that horrible, sick feeling that sits down inside of your stomach. And you know, maybe you ask this question and maybe you're in a bad relationship right now. Maybe it's not even a person. Maybe it's a bad habit that you've been dealing with. Or maybe it's something bad in your own life and you're ignoring the red flags because maybe something makes you happy, but you know that it's wrong for you and it's hurting you. You know, in James 4, 17, it says this. It says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, it's sin. 
And I know that's kind of hard to think about, but if you know what the right thing to do is and you're ignoring those things, you're ignoring the red flags, you're ignoring those warning signs, it's sin. And we have to repent to God and ask God to help us. You know, here are some next steps that I feel like that you can take if this is you. First, ask God to help you. What does this look like? This looks like asking Jesus, say, say, Jesus, help me have the courage to step away from this, from this person, from this pattern, from this habit, if it doesn't honor you. We would also call this repentance, right? Repentance is turning the opposite direction away from sin. Number two is tell a trusted leader. Find a leader that you trust, that you love, that can help you along the way. That's what spiritual family is all about, is that we're in this together and you're not meant to do life alone. You're not meant to walk through this alone, to walk away from a bad relationship, to walk away from a bad habit, to walk away from a bad pattern. That's when we buddy up. That's like great people like me and Liz. You know, we, we're friends and we're able to help each other through things. We have people like that for you too. If you're at home, if you're watching this right now, maybe you're going through some hard stuff. Maybe you're trying to walk away from something that you know is wrong and it makes you feel sick to your stomach afterwards, but you just don't know what to do next. These are the steps. I'll say it again. First, ask God to help you. And second, tell a trusted leader. And to wrap this up, I just want to remind you that everything that you need to be fulfilled comes from God. It doesn't come from that person. It doesn't come from a relationship. It doesn't come from a habit that you're doing or something that you feel like needs to fill you. Everything that you need comes straight from God, comes from His Word, and comes from spending time in God's presence. Also, that mistake doesn't make you who you are. That mistake is not your identity. That pattern is not your identity. God is our identity and God makes us who we are. That's such a great question and I'm so proud of whoever asked that because it takes a lot of guts, right? Yeah. It takes a lot of guts to ask. I know the red flags, but it's hard to say no. And I get it, it is hard, but you can do this and God is with you every step of the way. Well, that's all the questions we had just for the girls, but don't log off yet. We're not quite done. We have a couple more questions that we're actually gonna have the boys answer. So here they are. Awesome, Elevate. Welcome to the final week yes. of Asking for a Friend. I'm Luke. I'm Ryan. And we're excited to be here today taking right. some of your questions. And so first question here is just a fun one, and it says this. This isn't religious, but what do you do when people are singing happy birthday to you? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, it's like... It, it, what do you do with your hands? What do you do with your hands? <laughs> if it's like opening a bad gift, you know, what face do you make? Right. You know, who do like, you look at? Oh, thank you. You're at a Mexican restaurant and bring out this sweaty sombrero <laughs> that has been worn by hundreds of people. Yes. Do I put this on? Did y'all clean it? You know, is there like Lysol? I don't know. I usually, what I would do, seriously though, is just Why? sing along with them, okay? And um, <laughs> yeah. Do you say when they get to your name, to me? me? Yeah, okay. to me, to me. Okay. Yeah, it's not consistent. You know, I actually sang Happy Birthday to on Olive Garden one time, and I sang it to Jessica, but her name was Morgan, so. You said, oh, the wrong name? It was really awkward. Rip, big tip. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> hey, well, <laughs> we have a few questions again that we've gotten from Instagram from you guys, and so, Ryan, why don't you kick us off with this first one? Yes, here. absolutely. Um, really like this question. Uh, we had this one come in. It's, how can I build the confidence to make new friends? So again, it's how can I build the confidence to make new friends? I thought that was a really good question because, I mean, even for me, uh, it's, it can be a little tough sometimes to feel like you gotta step out there and make new friends, but what I think maybe you're also asking is this question, how can I be confident? Honestly, like how can I just be confident? Because something I think that you can do is when you learn to express confidence and step into confidence in one area, hopefully it can leak into all the other areas mm -hmm. of your life. And so I know a lot of times uh, we can think confidence is a charismatic personality, but it's actually a choice. It's actually a choice. So it's not so much like a, someone who's got like such a loud personality, oh, they're confident. Sometimes that person's actually not as confident in certain other areas of their life. So it's not a personality thing, it's more of a choice type thing. So you get to choose if you wanna be confident in whatever area that is. Now I know there's some people who kinda of are more outgoing, willing to talk to someone, jump out there, but mm -hmm. that, that's for everyone. We have to make a choice to be confident. And so I know you're thinking like, well, what is confidence? Well, you know, confidence is when you believe you're capable of doing something, whether that's hard or easy. Uh, whether it's like dunking basketball, whether it's ask a girl to prom in person, mm. uh, or it's, uh, you know, completing a workout challenge. But here's what I love what the Bible has to say to us. 
is Philippians 4.13. I think everyone loves this verse. Uh, if you're an athlete, you probably have this tattooed somewhere secretly on your arm, or maybe it's on a shoe, it's on your wall. But here's what it says. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, I love that, but I want to give some context to that verse because before then, in verse 12, Paul's actually talking about uh, the lack of finances that he has. Mm -hmm. He's talking about from a place of a deficit, from mm -hmm. a place of lack. And I love what verse uh, 412 says in Philippians, I have learned the secret of living in every situation, where, whether it is a full stomach or empty, with plenty or at little. So Paul's approaching this next verse out of a place of lack. And so maybe for you, you feel like, hey, I lack confidence. I don't really have confidence. Where do I get it from? Well, let's start right here with the source. Jesus is your source of confidence. Mm -hmm. He's where you start. Christ is the one who gives us strength. So you gotta start there first. If you can't get the belief right, it's gonna make it harder to step out and being confident. So that's where that starts. But let me give you something really practical that I've learned over the years that helps just me and some of our team is whenever you feel you're not confident in areas, say this, ask God, Lord Jesus, I ask that you give me confidence to, and then fill in the blank. Mm. And then make this statement of yourself every day. Jesus, I can do all things big or little because you give me strength. Make that declaration. And then just a couple other easy things. Do something hard. Okay. Do something that scares you. Do something you didn't know that you could do because you never know what you're made of until you do it. And when you actually do it, you then realize, you know what? I'm actually more capable than I thought. And when you learn you're more capable, you become to be more confident. So I think that helped you learn to make new friends. Step out, ask someone, yo, what's up? What, what are you doing this weekend? Let me hang out. Let's just, let's just, let's go hang out some. Let's play basketball or whatever. So let's jump on online Zoom calls. I was about to say, let's quarantine yeah. call. Let's quarantine <laughs> call. So that's, that's something I would say, you know, to how do I make new friends? How do I build confidence? You got to start with Jesus first. I love that. That's a good question right there. Here's another question um, from, from someone out there. It says, how do you minister to people who aren't living right without being condemning mm. or judgmental. That's a good, mm. how, so mm. how do you minister, how do you relate, how do you connect to somebody without being judgmental? Because right. in our culture today, you know, being judgmental is yeah. like the biggest sin that you can commit right. towards somebody. And so, yeah, Jesus was somebody who walked uh, in confidence yep. and, and in truth. So he wasn't afraid to go there with people, but at the same time, he never was, he never came across as judgmental and, and so, I, for me, I worked at Starbucks for a season before I came on staff at church. Yep. And Starbucks is great. How many of you love Starbucks? Sound off in the comments if you love Starbucks. Maybe Shout type out. in your drink order because I, I do want to know what it we is. We may hook so, you up. Yeah. Uh, maybe. That'd maybe. be a good giveaway. Good giveaway. And so Starbucks for me was great because I was able to be around people who did not know Jesus, weren't involved in church, and living really out their lives a lot of times. And I loved it because I, I never had to go and and be preachy or judgmental. I simply lived the life that Jesus had called me to live and I didn't back down from my morals or my character or, or what I believe God had called me to. And so I was able to influence these people um, in a way that they didn't have to step foot into a church to see that. And it was so right. cool to see what God did and I and I was able to, to share Jesus. And so I would go home from Starbucks smelling like coffee all yeah. the time and just getting the coffee on you. But I say that because other people are watching how you live as a young person. They're yeah. watching how you talk, yeah. how you interact on social media, um, what, what you, how you respond to adversity, all that kind of stuff. And whenever you've been around Jesus and with Jesus, just like I smelled like coffee when I left Starbucks, mm -hmm. people will smell that fragrance yeah. of God on you and they'll so see that on your life. Yeah. And so Zacchaeus is a great story in the Bible. Um, whenever Jesus went, he was a notorious sinner. Somebody, yeah. everybody knew who he was because he was not an honest person. And um, Jesus invited himself over to his house, sat at the table with all these notorious sinners. And just through Jesus's life and honoring them and, yep. and really living to what God had called Jesus to live, there was a radical change in that friend group. And so I would say that whenever you're living according to God's plan and, and character, then people will notice that. And so your question though, how do you minister to those people? Well, I, I really practically, are they your friend? Because if they're your friend, you should have influence with them and you yeah. could probably be a little more forthcoming and, and go there with that person and be like, hey, you said you want to live like God's called you to live. Yeah. Listen, I, I love you, but this is not your best. Like you have more and encourage them instead of being judgmental towards right. them or being critical of them. Uh, I would say if it's somebody who's not your friend and you don't really know them, 
it's probably not your place to, to go there and try to correct them unless you have influence with that person. And so I would say just love them, live like how Jesus lived in a way that, you know, you stand for what you believe is true, but at the same time, um, you don't back down from that. And Man, so, that's so good. That's so good, I love that. Your life is louder than your lips. Mm -hmm. Your life speaks louder, <laughs> whoa, your life speaks louder than you know, the way you live and what you say. So I love that. Powerful. Man. We have another question here. Um, it is, I think all of us have this one, honestly. Uh, how do I stay motivated to be close mm -hmm. to God? Um, I'll ask that again. How do I stay motivated to be close to God? And I gotta be honest, sometimes I ask myself this, you know, we, yeah, I think we that's all true. do. If we can so be honest, true. like, Lord, what, what can we do? Um, something I've learned and am continuing to learn just over the years, it starts with me that nobody else can motivate me. It's, it's gotta start first yeah. here. Because I, I was reading this question, I was wondering maybe is there another question behind this? Like, can someone else, you know, keep pushing me? And yes, they can, but at the end of the day, we're all responsible for our own choices and mm -hmm. our own decisions. And so I remember uh, one time, there's someone in my life um, who I, I respect today still, uh, said something to me, said, you know, Ryan, no one can do your own push-ups for you. And I remember I was like trying to have a, I was wanting them to relate with me and understand me, but I honestly was complaining about something. And they're like, look, no one can do your own push-ups, bro. Like, you gotta do them. I'm like, right now, I'm in a workout challenge trying to do all this stuff, and it's hard. Uh, it doesn't matter how many texts I get from these guys, no matter how many phone calls, FaceTimes, I am responsible for doing these. So I want you to know that getting close to God, sometimes I've tried to reason this away in other areas, and maybe some other people have, like, hey, it's a personality thing. Oh, they're just hardwired that way. Sure. Well, that's not true. It's not a personality thing. It's a discipline thing. Something that one of the pastors has spoken to me before is like, this isn't a personality thing. It's a discipline thing. It's making the decision. And I love that you made, you use this phrase, uh, word motivated. There's a word in there, motive. And I love what the Bible says that blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. When, you, when your heart right now, which it seems like it is so, so pure, God, I just wanna, I wanna meet you. I just yeah. wanna be with you. I wanna be around you you know, then you'll begin to see God uh, so much more in your life. But here's some practical stuff. Is that, um, I'm not much of a farmer, but I do know, Surprise. <laughs> shocker, I do know that there, um, you feed animals and there's like a pig's feed. And when you put in the pig's feed, you know, the pigs eat it, it's their food, it's what they nourish is their, their body. Well, whatever you put in them, they, they eat that. that. That's what fills them. Mm -hmm. It's a pig's feed. But there's also online feed that if you keep feeding yourself news and things that could be um, detrimental or on your own social feed or whatever feed it is, if what's on that feed is filling you, but the word of God's not filling you, then you're gonna not feel motivated. You're not gonna feel like that because what you feed yourself is gonna fuel you. And if you're fueling yourself with, or feeding yourself with anxiety and like what's going on and confusion, you're gonna feel that way. And so my challenge to you would be, when's the last time you checked your feed? When's the last time you unfollowed somebody, unfollowed something so that you could then check into God's word? What does God's word have to say about me? What does God's word have to say about my life? So here's something I want you to try to do right now, like right there in your spot. I want you to say this, I need a new feed. Mm. Come on, do it again. I, I know, I maybe like, feed. you probably didn't know. Say this out loud, say, I need a new feed. I love that, see that's awesome. We all need a new feed. So here's just three practical ways that you can walk this out. Number one, fast. So you get close to God. How to stay motivated, fast. What does that mean? Abstain from something. Mm -hmm. um, in the Bible, biblical fast is food, which is yeah. tough, but you can do it. Another way is pray God's word. Pray it hot, like pray it, pray it till it, it, so it gets all up in you and you believe that and, and receive that from God. And third thing, is focus on a better feed. Stop focusing so much on what's going on way over here. Let's try to recenter our focus back in the Word of God and let the Word of God feed our soul because then what's gonna come out of you is peace, mm. hope, mm -hmm. security in Christ. Yeah. And so how do I stay motivated in God? Get in God's Word, get in His presence. Come That's on. what I always say, man. I need a new feed, I love that. I love that. And I think honestly, this next question, a lot of what you just said, Ryan, applies to this, but this person asked, and just thank you again for being vulnerable with this question, says, how do you find God when you hit your low? How do you find God when you hit your low? And what I love about the Bible is the Bible is not, um, it's not edited, it's not a safe book, it's not something that is so clean cut and, you know, 
a lot of times we think we have to put on the face and put on the, the feet and look and look the right way and stuff like that. But the Bible have, have these people that, man, they messed up big and they hit some really low lows. And so Moses um, murdered somebody, you know, and yeah. had a really low moment there. Um, Joseph, who we're gonna talk about in a few weeks, mm -hmm. Joseph had uh, just some crazy stuff happen to him as a kid that really affected him. David committed adultery. Even Jesus was betrayed by his closest friends, yeah. uh, isolated, all these things. And so all of these people hit a low. And what I think happens is sometimes in your low spot is really that's your place of surrender. It's whenever you, whenever you hit your low and you're asking, how do I find God when I hit my low? Well, the good thing about Jesus and God is we, we don't have any way to get to God's level. And so he always meets us at our level. And so when you're in your low spot, Jesus is there with you. He's in your level. We don't have any way to, to work, our, work our way to God or, or, or be a good enough Christian or person. And so yeah. Jesus, he always comes down and meets you in your low spot. Psalm 34, 18 actually says this. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted yeah. and he rescues those who are crushed. And so if, if you're in a low spot, you're feeling isolated, maybe you messed up, you did something that you regret, God is there with you in that moment. And like I said, the Bible's un, unedited yeah. it's, and it shows us really, you know, real people, real individuals. There's a guy named Elijah in the Old Testament and Elijah just had this big, awesome moment. He had this, this emotional high and then he has a very low moment yep. and he starts having some suicidal thoughts actually and just in a really low spot and in that moment in his lowest spot that's where the god meets him yep. that's where he finds that he's okay i'm in this low spot i can't do it on my own yep. i've tried and, and you you reach that place of surrender and you find out you know what god you're, you've been there the whole time you you're at, you're with me at my high and you're with me here in my low and, and the bible says that god wants to carry your burdens and that he's close to the brokenhearted and god loves you and he's for you and i promise that you're in a valley now but it, this isn't a, you're gonna cut out of this. You're gonna come out of this. God's got more for you. He has a purpose yeah. for you, a plan for you. He believes in you. Yeah. We believe in you, we love you. And so how do you find God when you're at your low? I believe that, that whenever you cry out to God with the right heart, that he'll meet you there. Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you'll find me. And so I just wanna encourage you, if you want more of God, you, you, you check your feed like Ryan was saying. You're, maybe you're in a low spot right now. Wholeheartedly go after Jesus um, and, and, and you'll be shocked and surprised at how he shows up in your life. And absolutely, so, um, yeah. So thank you so much, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank we, you. We just pray for us actually? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Let's do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for all of those who are tuning in online right now. God, I pray for all of those that are watching, Lord, all the students and Lord, and some of our parents that are tuned in. God, that everything that's been dis discussed and talked about, Lord, that uh, you, you've spoken to them. Lord, that you would, you would do a work in their heart, Lord, that we know that your word does not return void, but accomplishes what it was set on this earth to do. And so, God, I just pray for hope to fill the hearts of everyone watching this. God, I pray for encouragement to come. Lord, I pray you give everyone the boldness and the strength to live out uh, what your word says, to live out who you called us to be. And so, Lord, meet them right there where they're at. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.